vision So be still my soul This is a realm of your glory. This is a realm of your grace. I can feel your mighty power. It is moving in this place. In the presence of angels, with God's glory on their wings, like the voice of many waters, I can hear. Holy, 
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are holy. You're holy. And Lord, you've called us to be like you, holy. And Lord Jesus, I don't know about everybody, but I know some of us are tired of being like the world. And we want to be holy. We want to be like you. We want to be pleasing in your sight. We want to be, Lord Jesus, more than overcomers, Lord. We want to be examples and shining lights to everybody around us that when they see us, they see you. Oh, Lord, take all complacency from our hearts right now, Lord. Take all lukewarmness from our hearts right now, Lord. And give us the fire of your presence in our spirits. Right now, Lord, we say fire. Let your fire, Lord Jesus, burn within us brightly. Let the incense altar, Lord Jesus, just be filled with praise towards you, Lord Jesus. Let's just praise him right now. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We lift up your holy name because you are holy and you are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. 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 Have your way in this place, Lord. Have your way in this place, Lord. Every chain, let it fall off right now, Father, in Jesus' name. And let your people, Lord, walk freely in your spirit, Lord. Have your way in this place. Have your way. Have your way. We praise you. We worship you. Jesus, you are holy. And you've called us to be holy. 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 Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Para masorachini ba 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 Who has a word from the Lord? Who has a word from the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. All right, this kind of isn't a word, but it's a word. I don't know how to say this, but the Lord has laid it really, really hard upon my heart, and He has been speaking to me throughout the week um, as to what I'm supposed to say when I get up here, but I don't really know that's what's going on all week long until I get here. So all week long, he has been touching me 
in my spine. Um, my husband has had to pray for me repeatedly from the top of my, I mean, from the bottom of my neck to the bottom of my tailbone. I mean, I've just been in pain all week in different areas. And it's like the Lord has now told me that the reason I went through that is because there are people here that are experiencing this pain and they are being tormented by the enemy giving you pain in your back and your back is a terrible place to have any pain. And in the name of Jesus, if you have any pain in your body, stand up. Because I want to pray for you. I want to have the Lord remove this pain from your body and that you would never walk in it again because there is no reason for any of us to suffer anymore. If you have, be brave. Come on, stand up if you've got any pain. Tim, if you're the only one, Jamie, you have pain? Okay. Okay, come on. You can just stand where you are. I got you. Well, Jesus got you. I don't. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I declare all pain to go. I declare now in the mighty name of Jesus that there is no more pain in these bodies, that they would stand erect and they would know that the pain is gone, that they would walk in peace, that they would have this peace from now throughout eternity, that this torment would never, ever come to them again in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right, Frida's doing great. Thank you, Lord. Tim, tell me your pain's gone. Okay, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Teresa. Hi, guys, this is me again. Um, when I was at work, this week, I've got a vision of, you know, the Bible where the, the ch when the children of Israel were in the desert and the people who murmured and complained how the ground sunk in and they got consumed. And God, the word God told me was, step away from those things, those people, those things that are not of me. Let go of those things that no longer apply to the situation because things are happening to things and people and we don't want to be anywhere near that at least I don't he's telling us to walk away if it's alcohol, drugs, whatever it is God is telling you to walk away and step away run <laughs> because things are happening and we have to be careful that we are in the right place and not caught up in the wrong environment and not around the wrong people, allowing the wrong influence over us. Because he's calling us for holiness and purity and to shine in this world. And he's calling us to walk forth in him and show him throughout the world and not be deceived by the things of this world because he's calling us into a new realm, a higher realm, where we are accountable and we cannot just get by on our laurels. We have to be accountable, active, proactive, and connected. Amen. Thank you, Hallelujah. Joanna. Hey, Joanna. Nice and loud. Okay, Jesus is saying, children, my children, you are in a dark, dark world now. You are called to separate yourselves from the darkness and be the light that I have placed in you. You are to be the light. And as you know, a room that is totally dark but has one little match lit, it lights up the whole room. You can see every corner in the room. That's how powerful we are. And he says, children, I love you so. I have given you this light. I want you to show everybody that you are around, every single person that you are around, that you are my light, that you are separated from the world, the darkness that's going on right now. You are separated from that. And you will remain separated through the days of your life, walk with me and you will be my light and the darkness will flee. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, God says, you are my children. You are with me right now. That you are not of this world. That I have separated you from it. You are just ambassadors to this world to tell others about my kingdom, my love, my joy, my peace. You are to be that in this world, but as my children have been saying this morning, separated from it. This flesh that you live in will die and go into the ground, but you shall live forever with me in the heavenlies, seated with me in the heavenlies. That's where you are right now. Realize that. Let it become reality to you. Walk in that because it is reality. I said so in my word. I showed you in my word. The truth that I speak shall not come back void. My truth is that you're not here. You're with me. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And let's give the worship team a little thanks. Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. All right. You just go ahead. I'll get to you. <laughs> I got you. I got you. All right. So thank you so much for coming today. It's a beautiful day. And you're in the house of the Lord on a beautiful day. And the Lord's going to bless you. Whatever you came for, I believe the Lord's going to give to you more than you came for. The Lord is good. And as we heard last week, the Lord is a giver. He's a lover and he's a giver. And the Lord gives abundantly. He doesn't give sparingly. He tells us to sow a, sow a, a, a bound in, in our sowing and to sow abundantly. So you wouldn't expect he'd sow sparingly, would you? You know, he sows abundantly. And we learned from last week, one of the Psalms says that he daily loads us with benefits. Daily loads us with benefits. So the Lord is good. Timothy, why don't you come up here, Timothy? All right. Timothy. Now, a lot of you may not know Timothy, but Timothy's not a lone ranger. Timothy comes once a week. He and I have a good long conversation, and we've been really uh, praying, studying the Bible together. And uh, Timothy, uh, the Lord put it upon his heart to start a particular ministry, and this church is kind of the launching pad for that. So, Timothy, why don't you give us a little rundown on that? Sure. Sorry, I just launched it last night, so I didn't have time to um, get a slide up here for you. Um, so about a year ago, um, it was right actually after one of our meetings, um, I was driving home, and all of a sudden, lost and found kept just repeating in my mind and heart, lost and found, lost and found, lost and found. And I'm like, okay, God, what is this? And then all of a sudden, it was the Father's lost and found. And I was like, okay, the Father's lost and found. Okay, what is this? And uh, by the time I had gotten home from the church, I had a complete map out of a ministry. Um, the logo, the people that are, were going to be on the board of directors, I mean, I, I had a full outline of what God wanted me to do. And over the last year, I have, in obedience, been working on that. And um, as of last night, I, uh, I launched the website. And um, it is a street ministry um, that will be for um, whoever wants to volunteer um, to reach the homeless and reach those in need, um, supplying them with food and supplies and uh, just being who we're called to be. Um, you know, it's, it's that time of, of showing those who are suffering and showing those who are struggling who they really are in Christ and how God sees them. So the ministry is to treat and show the homeless and the needy that they are kings and queens um, in the Father's eyes and that there's no mistakes in his plans and that they're just, they're so perfect and this ministry is just for volunteers um, with um, like, like-minded and like-hearted to just come together and to just serve these people, to love on them, and to just share the word of God with them and to just lay hands on them. I just see healing upon healing upon healing. 
and you know the the word uh, the Lord gave me a, a word this morning, and uh, you know I, I thought it was for the congregation, and it might be, um, but it, it was it was really for like for those that are interested in volunteering. Um, he kind of just placed this in my heart. It says, "My children, you know, my spirit will bring to life every seed planted in my name." I am the, I am the, you do that every time. I am the good seed. I call you to plant me in the hearts of everyone around you. Let your light shine in this world. You be the salt that I've created you to be. Faith without good works is dead, but you have been given life, so live. I will continue to water you with my spirit until you have grown into full maturity. I have given you life and life abundantly. I am the vine and you are the branches. When you are in me, I give you everything you need. I will supply you with what you need to blossom into a flower with more splendor than all the riches in the world. Do not keep me prisoner in your own heart, but release me into the world wherever you go. My spirit leads you and my glory goes behind you. I carry you in the palm of my hands and under the shadow of my wings. Do not fear man, but fear the Lord, for I am good. And that's just, you know, it's... A word for you, a word for me, a word for the ministry, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, I just love it when God speaks like that because you know it's from him because of the beauty of the words. And uh, it just, it penetrates the soul when you hear words like that because uh, it, it just, it can't come from man. And uh, so, yeah, um, the website is www.lostfoundministry.com. Um Lost Found Ministry, that was the domain, the only thing that, ministry, ministry. yep, and uh, so next week I'll, I'll put some flyers out there just so that you can have the website, have the Facebook, and uh, so that you can just begin sharing it, and uh, I know that God doesn't do anything small, um, so I just, I see this ministry just launching and just becoming huge. And partnering with this church to have a outreach program that's just going to reach all of Seattle area and uh, just flood these doors with uh, with lost souls. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Then, but wait, there's more. Um, I think it's eight years ago or so, uh, Jair's brother, Mike came down with some kind of dread disease that I can't even describe what the name is or anything. It's like beyond me. But he's been plagued, plagued, plagued. And the doctors tried everything. They cannot cure it. Cannot cure it. It's just ongoing. And uh, Gail has a little something to tell us. And JR, maybe you want to come up. I don't know. Just Gail. Gail's going to tell us about something that just happened. So, uh, (laughs) So as Tom said, this has been ongoing for eight years, and many of you have prayed for Mike. He uh, has six children, and so for many of these children's, um, much of these, some of these younger ones' lives, they've had a very sick daddy. The I can't pronounce the whole name of this, but basically his, it's an autoimmune disease where his body began just suddenly overproducing this acid um, in his blood to just thousands of times greater. And what happens is this acid begins to attack various organs of the body. And so it, and it's extremely painful and debilitating. And there is no cure for it. There's treatment, and he's gone through eight years of various treatments. And, oh yeah, it's a huge amount of money a month. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. So anyway, and he has had a little bit of relief here and there, but nothing, as I say, there is no cure. So, um, and you know, sometimes you kind of get tired of praying for people. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. I mean, eight years is a long time. It's like, Lord, maybe for whatever reason this is your will that he's just going to have this thing, you know. But we still kept praying. And in December, of all things, he comes down with COVID. And now it's like, really? Now he's got to have this, and he's got COVID, and that could kill him because he's got damage to his lungs and various organs, and he was really sick for two weeks. Yesterday, we had lunch with them, and JR 
ask, say, how's it going? Now, see, keep in mind, we don't ask him every single time we see him because who wants to go through this, you know, trauma all the time? But he asked him kind of on the side, hey, how's it going? He said, okay, I wasn't going to tell you this yet. He said, you know, I had COVID in December, yeah? I recovered from COVID, and suddenly I don't have this anymore. And we're like, what? You know? And he's like, yeah, I've been to the doctor, and I've had two tests now, and my esophilias, which is the name of this little thing that we all have in our blood, um, is normal. Then another test, normal. And he's going in for a third test sometime this week, and that's what he was kind of waiting for. But wow, what a thing. I mean, it just... It, and, of course, the doctors have no real explanation as to why this thing would just stop after COVID. You know, it is an autoimmune disease. Um, but it just reminds us that, at least for me and JR, that sometimes the things that we think of as a curse, COVID, can be the one thing that God chooses to use as his servant for good in our lives. And, you know, it, when you think back to your own lives, I mean, I know there have been some pivotal times in my life where things happened you know, death of a spouse, job loss, layoffs, and we think, oh my gosh, that's a curse, you know, but really God was preparing us to walk into the greatest blessing of our lives. And so I just say this this morning as an encouragement, don't give up praying, you know, and don't be tempted to put God in a box that says, well, you gotta, you got to do this. I'm going to bring him into the service. We're going to lay hands on him. You're going to heal him. And if he doesn't get healed, you're not going to heal him. Don't be tempted to do that because I'm here to tell you, we can't tame that lion of Judah. He's not going to be put in a cage that we can put a little box around and say, well, if you don't, you can't come out because he is going to break through anything. And he broke through that for Mike. And we are trusting God that this third test is going to show the results, and I, I would just love to be a little mouse in the corner, a fly on the wall or whatever, when those doctors look at that and think, I don't know how to explain this, but suddenly you don't have this anymore. Amen. So that's a good, did you want to say something? Huh? Oh, well, yeah, my sister, um, she's, yeah, she's a believer. She's a wonderful person. Uh, she got saved uh, right after I got saved. Uh, um, I, I brought her boyfriend at the time to the Lord, and suddenly her boyfriend wouldn't sleep with her. So she calls me at 3 o'clock in the morning and goes, what have you done to Gary? I go, well, let me tell you, I told him about Jesus, and she got saved, and so their whole family saved. But my sister, um, she, she was diagnosed with a type of cancer recently. And uh, so they said, well, you got to go through all these treatments and all this stuff. So she came to Paul and I. She's like, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for me. We're going to go through this together, but we're going to pray. So anyway, my sister um, talked to her just uh, about five days ago. And uh, she's gone through some of the processes, but it looks like she's cancer-free. God's healing her, healing her from... He has to... Now, God is healing her now from some of the treatment because treatment can be damaging. She's cancer-free, and she's given it all to Jesus, all the glory and all the honor, and we're just thankful because you got to, you know what, you pray, and, and the, the answer to the question is how long should you pray is in, until you get results. So we keep praying, and, and you know, Gail and JR and all of us have prayed for Mike, and it's like, well, it's eight years, you know, uh, should we do it one more time? Yeah. I remember there was a young lady that used to go to this church, and uh, she had glaucoma, and uh, my mother-in-law and I, we went on this trip, and she was with us. It was kind of a church kind of trip thing down in Oregon coast. And uh, asked her, you know, so what's wrong? Why well, she had glaucoma in her eye. She was going blind. And uh, I said, has anybody ever prayed for you about that? She goes, hundreds of people have prayed. Nothing's happened. So I said, would you mind if my mother-in-law and I pray for you one more time? We prayed for her. She got healed, completely healed. She's healed to this day. So never give up on your prayers. That next prayer could be the one, all right? So keep praying. So today, the title of our message is, What Really Matters? 
what really matters in life. There is a tiny window along the timeline of eternity, and in this very tiny space, every person lives their earthly life. It's a tiny window. In all the timeline of eternity, you last for a very short time on this earth. It's like a puff of smoke that life soon is over. Now, when you're five years old, right, then the thought of being 10 years old, that's a lifetime away. But when you're 70 years old, five years is pretty short. It's not a lifetime away. It's just a blink of the eye. This life is like a puff of smoke, and then it's no more. And here's what James says, James 4, 14. Why you do not even know what will happen on tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. For a little while and then it's gone. That's your life. You say, I've got time. This is the funny thing about people. We say, I think I have some time to get my act together, get my life together, get things on track. You say that, but the fact of the matter is, you do not know what will happen on tomorrow. You don't know if it's your last day. You don't know if you have 10 years, 20 years, one year. So we have to live our life with a mindset that today has to count. Today has to count. In this extremely brief moment on the timeline of eternity, we have our one and only chance. Listen to this. We have our one and only chance to do the things that position us for whatever happens in our afterlife. You realize that it's what you do here in this brief moment that makes all the difference for eternity. Whether you're in heaven with Jesus or not, whether you receive any crowns for your good good deeds or not, it's all done right here, right now. You have a short little window of time. This present life is not, it's not a dress rehearsal for something else. This is the act, this is it. We're on stage. It's right now. We are doing the performance of our life right now, and every second matters, and there won't be a second, a second act. This is it right now. This is it. This is your life right here. What really matters in this life? I mean, in the really big picture of eternity, what really, really matters? Well, if you don't know Jesus, then you're not going to know what really matters, right? But I assume most of you know Jesus. If you do know Jesus, you have the ability to know and to find out what really matters. But if you still don't seek the answer for what really matters, you may never quite get around to it. You see, we're supposed to diligently seek the Lord. We're supposed to diligently study the Word of the Lord so that the Lord can can communicate to us what we need to know while we're here on stage. This is it. This is the performance. You don't get a second chance. This isn't an audition for something. This is it. This is live. It's right now. And this really matters right now. What really matters? What really matters in your life? Do you suppose the kind of car you drive really matters? In eternity, I mean, in eternity, it doesn't really matter. You know, there's a lot of cool gadgets we can have here on earth, but I guarantee you, in eternity, there'll be no gadgets. You don't need them. You don't need them. Well, I'm going to have this really cool big screen. You won't need that. You won't be interested in that. Okay? Do you remember the day in high school? High school. That was a trying time of life for most of us. Some people, that was their glory days. It was not my glory days. I couldn't wait to get through it, right? But you remember that time in high school where you woke up one morning, and there was a big pimple right in the middle of your forehead, and at that moment, that's what really mattered. You decided, I don't even know if I want to go to school today. I don't know if I want to be seen by people today. I mean, it looks like Mount Fujiyama is about to erupt, and it's like, "Ah, I can't be seen, right? That really mattered. But now that you look back, does that matter anymore? Does that matter at all? That was a day you didn't want to be seen, but it really didn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. It was something that caused a temporary upset for you, perhaps. But when you're 90, you're not going to be traumatized by that still. Now are you? Okay. Do you remember how important it was for you to get your first job? Oh, it was so hard. 
And that job was a lousy job, let me tell you, that I got, my first job. I worked at Royal Fork as a busboy. And I'm going to tell you, it was my first job, 16 years old. And Royal Fork is a buffet where everybody comes in and eats as much as they can eat. And they can put as many plates out as they want on the table, and they just stack and plate stuff. It was a horrible job. And they promised me I would be a busboy. And I thought, a busboy. Someday I'll graduate and be a bus man. But right now I'm going to be a busboy. So I was a busboy. I thought I was a busboy. And the minute I got in there, they did the old switcheroo with me. They go, you know, we're short of uh, dishwashers. You're a dishwasher. I go, no, not a dishwasher. That's the most dreaded job of all. And I'm not kidding. That first night was one of the hardest work nights of my whole life. The place was closed, and there were these bus tubs full of dishes, and they were down a hallway and around a corner, dishes, dishes, endless mountain of dishes. That was my first job. It really mattered to get that first job. It doesn't really matter anymore, you know. How about that big test? You just had to pass. You just have to pass that test. It's the most important thing in your life. If you pass this test, and you know, right now, probably doesn't really matter a whole lot, does it? That big game you, you wanted to go to and see in person, that big concert you wanted to see that person in person, it, it really doesn't matter. In the big picture, it really doesn't matter, okay? Your fitness goal, that competition you really wanted to win, it, it, it really, in the big picture, doesn't matter, you know? Right now, it doesn't matter. All that stuff's behind you. Those things matter to you at the time. They really did, but in the big picture, they don't really matter anymore. All right? Now, most things that really matter, on any given day, on any given day, they don't really matter in the big picture. In other words, we get all hyped up. We get all upset about something today or tomorrow or this week. But you know what? A few weeks later, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So... What if the entry in the book of all things ever done in your life on earth was summed up with this little statement at the bottom that said, they never did anything that really mattered. <laughs> Woo, that would be bad. Here's what it says, Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books. And one of them was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. And each one was judged according to the deeds he had done in his life that were written in these books. What's written in your book? What have you done that really matters? That's sobering, isn't it? Books containing every deed that had ever been done by every person that had ever lived. And you know what? Fortunately, if you are saved, the book of life, your name's in that one. Right? But even though your name is in the book of life, what you did here also will be assessed. Because it talks about how people will be rewarded for how they live their life. And some more and some less. Doesn't it? In a brief puff of vapor called life, we have a little time to make some very important choices. That's right now. But in the really big picture, how many of those choices are really going to matter in eternity? The choices we make today. Suppose you invented a new kind of battery for electric cars that could go a whole year on one charge. You would be a big deal. In eternity, nobody cares. Suppose you had become a real estate mogul and had, like Donald Trump, you had bought many properties and developed them around the world and you'd become a multi-billionaire. Do you suppose in eternity any of that matters at all? It really doesn't matter. Well, this isn't being said to make you feel better about not having great achievements like these people I was just talking about. Because even if you have low achievement, <laughs> even if you have little achievement, even if you have no achievement, it still matters what you do with this life. You know, suppose, in the, on the other hand, since you're not the uh, big wheeler dealer and you're not the great inventor, suppose you're the dishwasher, like I was, in a restaurant and you collect comic books and you spend 90% of your time binge watching The Simpsons re your reruns. In the big picture, do you suppose any of that will really matter? It won't really matter. You know what? It reminds me of a Simpson episode. 
years ago. I haven't watched it in years. But I remember this little boy. They, there's this atomic explosion. You see this mushroom cloud billowing, and, and, and it's the end of the world. And this little boy runs out, and he's, he's got all his comic book collection. He goes, I've wasted my whole life on comic books. Kind of poignant. But that's what some of us do. We waste our whole life on trivial, trivial things that really don't matter, on things that don't really add up to anything in eternity. So these kind of questions are the things that went through the mind of the wisest man who ever lived, the most successful man who ever lived on earth, and his name was Solomon. And it is generally agreed that Solomon was probably, thank you, don't know what that was, Solomon was probably the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's not a very uplifting book, the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, it's kind of sobering. But it's a self-examination of the life lived by a man with immense power and influence. And what he was really searching for was the answer to the question, what really matters? So here's what it says, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 3. These are the words of the teacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Futility of futility, says the teacher. Futility of futility. Everything is futile. What does a man gain from all of his labor in which he toils under the sun? Now, you might say, well, this guy had a bad attitude. You know, this guy had a lot of experience. See, he searched for meaning before he wrote this. He tried everything he knew that was in the world to see if anything really made a difference, really was important in the long run, in the big picture. If anything truly brought satisfaction to the soul, he tried everything you can think of. All the things that you think of would bring you peace, would bring you joy, would bring you uh, happiness. He tried them. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11 he says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy what is good, but it proved to be futile. I said of laughter, it is folly, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I sought to cheer my body with wine and embrace folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom until I could see what was worthwhile for men to do under the heaven during the few days of their lives. I expanded my pursuits. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself where I planted all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to water my groves, flourishing the trees. I acquired men servants and maid servants. Servants were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And I accumulated for myself silver and gold and treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered myself male and female singers and the delights of the sons of men, many concubines. So I became great and surpassed all in Jerusalem who had preceded me and my wisdom remained with me. Anything my eyes desired, I did not deny myself. I refused my heart no pleasure for my heart took delight in all my work and this was a reward for my labor. Yet when I considered all the works that my hands had accomplished and what I had toiled to achieve, I found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. This is a man who had all the success that people are striving for and hoping for and saying, if I could only get there, if I could only have that kind of success, if I could only make that kind of money and do those kind of things, I think I would find fulfillment and happiness. He says, I tried all that. It's all futile. It all counts for nothing. Why do people want to be rich? You know, there's a surface answer. Most people will come up and that answer is, um, you know, well, I... I think riches will make me happy. Below the surface, what it is, is is trying to find out what the thing is that's missing that only God can fill. It's a spot that only God can fill. And you think, if I was rich enough, I could probably satisfy that spot within me that's empty. But it's impossible. God made it impossible. He's the only one that can fill that space, fill that void, and make your life meaningful. The real reason that people want to be rich is they believe it'll make them happy. And when they get rich, they realize it didn't make them happy. And now they're less happy because now they don't know what to do. They got what they wanted and it still didn't work. Right? If a person became very rich, imagine you did get very rich, but you were not loved. You did not feel any self-worth. You did not feel that you had any purpose, that all of that money, all the money in the world really wouldn't make you happy. It wouldn't make you happy. Being rich 
or famous or powerful or popular are all illusions that the devil sells to people who are searching for happiness but don't know where it's at. And they think, if I just get that, if I was just famous, I can't tell you how many famous people, once they got famous, they felt separated from everybody. They felt like people only like me because they think I'm this person on the screen. They don't know me. They don't love me for me. They only, they only bow down to me because I have fame, because I have money, because I'm rich, but they don't love me. You know? Have you ever really wanted something like riches or a fancy car or fame or a luxury home and then gotten really sick? When you're really sick, when you're nauseated, none of that stuff matters. You've got the most beautiful, coolest car in the driveway, and you're sick as a dog. You go, right now, I really don't care. I really don't care. I just want to be better. I want to get better. That's all that matters. Having all the things you want, not having good health, shows you how unimportant those things really are in the big picture. Ecclesiastes, again, 6, 1 through, 1 through 2. There's another evil I have seen under the sun, and it weighs heavily upon mankind. God gives a man riches, wealth, and honor so that he lacks nothing that his heart desires, but God does not give him uh, the ability to enjoy them. Instead, a stranger will enjoy them. This is futile and grievous. Okay? Now, if you have all the caviar you can eat and all the filet mignon you can eat, but you don't have an appetite, it's pointless. It's worthless. Life is short. Eternity is long. We all have been given a short time to make a difference for eternity. It's right here. It's right now. You don't have another year that we know for sure. We don't know how long we have. There's an old song that never said a truer word. It says this. One life will soon be passed. Only what you do for Christ will last. That's it. That's it. In the summation of all things, that's it. Only what you do for Christ, for the kingdom of God. That's the only thing that will last for eternity. Nothing else will how many days do you have left? I don't know. Do you? You don't, do you? Think about it. How many days do you have left? Do you realize that none of us knows the answer to that? I suppose. Sometimes we think we know the answer to that. Like Joanna, years ago, she had stage four cancer. And I suppose the doctor says, well, you got about this long. They were wrong. She's alive today. There's other people, though, that think, I'm healthy. I've got my whole life ahead of me. They go out and get hit by a car. They're dead. You don't know how long you have left. Ephesians 5.15 says this. Pay careful attention, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. You've got to redeem the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When you understand what the will of the Lord is, then you can apply yourself to accomplishing what the Lord has willed for your life so that your life will be fulfilled. But if you're foolish, you don't pay attention to that stuff, okay? And you know what? When you live your life all to yourself, for yourself, for your own desires, to satisfy self, and you die, your life is a tragedy. It's a complete waste. It's a waste. Now, a nurse who worked with, in hospice care witnessed many people dying during her career. And these are the top five regrets people who were on their deathbed stated. Number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected me to live. This was the most common regret of all when people realized that their life was almost over and they could look back clearly on it. And it was easy for them to see how many dreams had gone unfulfilled because they hadn't gone for it, right? They hadn't tried to accomplish what God had put in their hearts. And they died knowing that they hadn't made the choices that really mattered. Right? Number two, regret. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. The nurse said this came from every male patient that she nursed. Every male patient. They missed their children's youth and their partner's companionship. And women also spoke of this regret. But, at most, uh, but, but as most uh, were from an older generation, many of the females didn't work that this person had been around, but they regretted spending so much time on working on things and not working on relationships. That was the second greatest regret of all. Number three, I'd wish I had had the courage to express my feelings honestly. 
There said many people suppress their feelings in order to keep the peace with others. And as a result, they settled for a mediocre existence and never became who they were truly capable of becoming. Number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. The nurse said often they would not truly realize the full benefits of friendship until their dying days, and then they realized how important those people were and how neglected they had been. Number five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. The nurse said this is a surprisingly common one. Many did not realize until the end that happiness is a choice. They had stayed stuck in old patterns, in old habits, the so-called comfort zone of familiarity, and it had overflowed into their emotions and taken over their life, and they really just didn't let themselves enjoy what life's really about. You know what? When you don't have Jesus in your life, you really don't have a reason to be really happy. But when you have Jesus, you don't have a reason to be really depressed. Because you have eternal life. Because you have God the creator in your heart. Because you have the Holy Spirit. Because you have blessings that are eternal. All of those regrets were from regular everyday people. Not necessarily Christians. Just regular people. Not a single one said anything about how they wish they had achieved more in their business life. Or their education. Or recreation. None of them had wished they had bigger houses or more cars on their deathbed. They really couldn't care less. Right? None of them wished they had had more money. In fact, all of the things they regretted had nothing to do with something you could buy. It had to do with their relationships and their choices. When you live this life without purpose, your life is one of futility, meaninglessness, but everyone who's called by Christ is called with a purpose. God has given all of us a purpose, okay? And if we pursue the purpose he has set us on this earth for, it will bring you satisfaction. It will bring you joy. It will bring you fulfillment because that's what really matters. Christ created you for a purpose. It's completely understandable why the world doesn't understand what really matters. But it isn't understandable why the church doesn't understand what really matters. Why are we like the world? Why do we think like they think? Why do we see how they project their lives and say, I want to pattern myself after that? Why do we do that? Because we don't know what really matters. If anyone should know the truth, it should be us, shouldn't it? If we have drunk the Kool-Aid of the world and have believed the lies that all the things outside of walking with Christ will somehow bring us joy, bring us peace, bring us satisfaction then we're just as deceived as the world, okay? About a week ago, I had an encounter with a few people. Two of them were my brothers, and one was my father. Now, my brothers are not walking with Jesus. Yes, I've witnessed to them. They're not walking with Jesus. They're very successful in the world's eyes. My brothers have millions of dollars. They've laid up for themselves huge treasures on earth. My father's getting very old. He's in his 90s. And I'm the youngest child, and my parents decided a number of years ago to make me the executor of their estate. I have power of attorney over all their finances and possessions. I never wanted that job, but they chose me because they trusted me. They knew where my heart was. Some business needs arose about a week ago about my parents' estate, and my two brothers were calling me and letting me know what their desire was. They both have millions. They both have heard about Jesus, but they've rejected him. They both are in a never-ending treadmill of doing business, of acquiring properties, of investing money, of working on projects. It's nonstop. It drives them in their lives. And yet they've made no provision for their eternal life. None. Okay? My wife had a boss years ago, a brilliant man. A man who made countless millions of dollars, but it was never enough because it was the only purpose he seemed to be living for. It's like the scoreboard of life was just how many dollars can you rack up, but there was no peace. There was no satisfaction. He was never satisfied because he didn't know what really mattered. He was always buying, selling, accumulating, climbing the ladder, acquiring possessions, and yet he never seemed to find joy in any of it. It didn't bring him joy. 
These men I'm speaking about are not lazy people. They're movers. They're shakers. They're successful in the world's eyes. But I know something. They're all on a treadmill that never brings them peace, that never brings them fulfillment, never brings them joy. Where they can experience in life the things that really, really satisfy. They can't find it. And do you know why they stay on these treadmills? Because when you reject Christ, you've rejected your purpose. And they try to distract themselves by doing other things, thinking, this is my purpose. And in the great distraction, you see, they can keep busy and they don't have to look in the mirror and face themselves and say, Do it, does my life really matter? If I just keep moving, if I keep building and keep doing, I won't have to look at myself and say, does any of this really matter for eternity? I could just, just keep going, just keep going, keep going, keep climbing that mountain. Those things are alien to me. Those folks are alien to me. Their whole life is about things that exclude the most important thing, which is knowing Jesus. Being a child of God, doing the things that count for eternity, that's what really matters. Psalms 49, 10 through 13 says this, For it is clear that the wise men die, and foolish, and the senseless both perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves were their eternal homes, their dwellings for endless generations. Even though their lands were their namesakes, they named their lands after themselves. But a man, despite his wealth, cannot endure. He is like the beast that perishes. This is the fate of the self-confident and their followers who endorse their saying. Their lives are futile. Their lives are pointless. Their lives are vanity. It's a chasing of mirages, a chasing of the wind. After my talk with my brothers, I was reminded again that their concerns, their goals, We're all about chasing illusions that if I get there, I'll have found joy. I felt after talking with them, polluted. I felt like, this doesn't feel good. Their world didn't feel good to me. Their world felt foreign to me, but also felt dirty. It's like, it's all about that. It's just about stuff. It's just about goals. It's not about what really matters. It's not about saving people's souls, bringing people into the kingdom of God. It's not about things that last for eternity. It's all about right now, and then you die, and it's over. That's it. What they thought really mattered wasn't what I think really matters. I realized that my brothers, my, former, my wife's former boss, were in an active pursuit of things that uh, never satisfied, so that's why you keep going. They had subconsciously busied themselves with so many distractions so they didn't have to face themselves. Because when you face yourself, you have to face. You have to face your undoneness. You have to face your helplessness. You have to face the fact that really, no matter how big you think you are, your life could be gone in a moment. Right? Ecclesiastes 6.9 says this. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. It's a chasing of the wind. Now, there was a man long ago named Asaph. He was one of the psalmists. And uh, he saw things through the eyes of the world. And this actually made him depressed. When you look at things through the lens of the world, it'll make you depressed because you're not designed for that. But then after a while, after seeing things in this wrong way, he came to himself. And here's what happens. Psalm 73, 1 through 28. Sounds like a lot of verses, but I want to paint this picture of this man. It says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, Asaph, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They envied what the wicked had. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Wow, they got it good, don't they? Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. Seems like nobody stops them. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. You know, they, they, they throw their weight around. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up the waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go amassing wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. I've been trying to be the good one. 
and I've missed out on all the good stuff. All the day long, I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. That's a bad lens to look through. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them in slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by tears. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved... And my spirit embittered, I was senseless and I was ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me... It is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. You see, he almost slipped, he said. I saw their prosperity. I saw how they got ahead in life, how nothing seemed to slow them down and everything went their way. But he says, then I came into the house of the Lord and I saw where they were really at. We need to wake up and realize what we really need and what really matters. We need to be thankful that we have Jesus in our hearts. You can be thankful that you have eternal life. But if you don't view things through an eternal perspective, then even the born-again Christian is not going to know what really matters. Martha was a good woman. She was a follower of Jesus. She was devoted to service. But she let the busyness of life distract her from what really mattered. Jesus said this to Martha when she was busied about her house, running about, saying, I, I just... Don't have enough time to get all this stuff done. Have my sister help me. That's what Jesus said, Luke 10, 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken from her. She was resting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the voice of Jesus. He said, she's chosen the only thing that actually matters. I had a friend named Eric. He was a good man. He was a moral man. He was a brother in Christ. He's my friend ever since fifth grade. He had scrimped and saved his whole life. He had cut himself out of a lot of good things he could enjoy because he was saving up because he wanted to amass a million dollars. His goal was to save a million dollars. And you know what? Something horrible happened to him. He got brain cancer. He told me before he died, as he was on his deathbed, He said, my greatest regret is that I didn't read God's word more and know the Bible as I should. Out of all the things, that was his greatest regret. I didn't know what I should know from the Bible, from what Jesus said. He said, I read all kinds of books about Christianity, but I didn't read the Bible enough. And out of all the things he regretted, he regretted that. What really matters? The things that are not of this world, what really matter? The things that are eternal, what really matter? The most important thing, of course, is knowing Jesus, but that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. What will you do with the life you have left? That's what really matters. Make sure you make it count for eternity. And when is it best to start? Today. Today. What really matters? Think about all the things you're upset about in life that you don't have all wrapped up in, with a nice little bow on them. Things you say, oh, this is a problem. I have this problem, this problem. I have this situation. If I only had more money, if I only had more of this, if I had a better job. Think of all that stuff. Now, that, I understand, will bother you right now. But in the big picture, does it really matter? In eternity, will you care? How much will you care about in eternity? I'll tell you what the most important thing is. The most important thing is that when you see Jesus, he says, well done. Because you actually did what really mattered. You actually did what he called you to do. You just didn't didn't do your own thing. You did what he called you to do. When you do that, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of your Lord. So today, as we leave, let's say, whew, oh boy, that really sobered me for a minute. But now I'm going to go back to life. Let's not go back to life. Let's let this cause us 
to have something within us, a seed that grows to say, I want to focus my life on the things that really matter for eternity. The most important thing is that I find Christ, but the second most important thing is that I show Christ to somebody else. The most important thing is filling God's kingdom with people. The most important things that you have and possess right now are your relationships with people. And the things that you take for granted, like your health, that you can actually be here. What really matters? Well, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you where to find it. It's in the Bible, and it's in your closet of prayer. Everybody has a specific calling, but all of us have a certain part of those callings that are, uni that are not unique. All of us should be alike. All of us should be witnesses. All of us should be ambassadors of Christ. All of us should be written, uh, uh, living epistles to all men. All of us should be holy. That's true. But then God also will have some specifics for just you. He says, I want you called to this. For Timothy, he says, Timothy, I want to call you to this ministry of the homeless. Do what he's called you to do, and your life will really, really matter. All right, we're going to stop there. Let's uh, just do this. If there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to get to know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you'll never find out what really matters. He's the starting point for what really matters. He's where you find eternal life, and without him, it's death and it's darkness. If you don't know Jesus, if you aren't committed to Jesus, if you haven't given your heart fully to Jesus, he's calling you. He's knocking on your door saying, come to me. I won't cast you out. He wants to make you a brand new creation. He wants to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life because that's what really matters. If you aren't walking with him, if you don't know him, but you want to, you say, I want to change today, then I invite you to raise your hand. And to be brave. And to hear his voice. And not to harden your hearts. Is there anybody? Raise your hand. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask Brother Aaron Baker. If you, is that microphone on, Aaron? Oh, no. Okay. Aaron, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for your living word, Lord. We thank you for how it nourishes us, and gives us wisdom and life. And we thank you for gathering us here today on this beautiful Sunday. I ask you, Lord, to continue to allow your word to permeate our spirits as we go forth this week. Protect us as we go, as we leave the church. But Lord, let your word continue to minister to our hearts. Let it unfold. Let it expand. Let it continue uh, bearing fruit that it was designed to bear. We thank you, Lord, and we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.